Well, I'm glad Michael's fired up this morning. I thought in the first service maybe it was just a little caffeine, but he's, he's really fired up, and that's a good thing. We should all be fired up, amen? What a great day this is. What a tremendous, tremendous day, and what a blessing it is to be able to, to come together and celebrate our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is a, a, a tremendous, tremendous blessing as we come together uh, for uh, something as, as enormous as this, and we think of the crucifixion of Christ, and we we're here Friday night, and if you were here Friday, many of us were wearing black. Uh, I just really don't like my black suit at all. Um, just want to say that. But, uh, you know, we were here, and, and we were contemplating what Christ had done on the cross for us. And then to come today and to be able to celebrate the resurrection, what joy it brings to our heart. We have been going through on Sunday mornings looking at the seven sayings of Jesus Christ as he's hanging on the cross. On Friday night, we looked at the words uh, simply, I am thirsty. And we've talked about the humanity of Jesus Christ and how it was illustrated by his words in just simply saying that in John chapter 19. And this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to look at these words. And John chapter 19, we're looking this morning uh, at the words of victory. And I'm thinking specifically about uh, what is referenced after Jesus says, I am thirsty. For the Bible tells us, uh, therefore, when Jesus had uh, finished or had, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. I believe that these words and what was finished could be said to be an enormous victory for Jesus Christ. And I hope this morning that we can convey the words, it is finished, in such a way that we all understand that to be words of victory. Let's look to the Lord, shall we? God, we just continue in prayer this morning, so very mindful of the glory of this hour. The opportunity that we have, Father, today to celebrate our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. What a joy that truly is to our heart. Help us, Lord, this morning as we contemplate those three little words, it is finished, to understand the magnitude of what Jesus was saying in his final breaths there on the cross. May you be glorified in all these things, I pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, this morning, if you came and you were looking for... Easter bunnies and Easter eggs and all of that kind of stuff. We don't have that here. Our focus is on Jesus Christ this morning, the risen Lord. However, I understand that many of you may be going out for dinner afterwards, and it's part of that. And I think it's wonderful to worship the Lord and then have a nice lunch. The story is told about a little boy. His name was Ernie. He and his family were invited to have Easter Sunday lunch at his grandmother's house. And so they traveled there after their church service. Everyone was seated around the table as the food was being served. When Ernie got his plate of food, he dug right in and started eating right away. And his father said, Ernie, wait until we say grace. I don't have to, the five-year-old replied. Of course you do, Ernest. You know, when you get to Ernest, you're in trouble. <laughs> his mother insisted rather forcefully, we always say a prayer before eating at our house. Ernie looks around and he says, that's at our house, but this is grandma's house and she knows how to cook. <laughs> well, this morning, turning our attention to John chapter 19, go grandma. Uh, <laughs> as we look at what has transpired here for Jesus on the cross, it is pretty amazing that we can look at this and we can see uh, the words of Jesus, it is finished. And we want to be able to explore what exactly that means. For we know and understand that there had been much accomplished on the cross. And we understand that the purpose behind Jesus' suffering, as outlined in 2 Corinthians there, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So this is the purpose for Jesus obviously going to the cross. And it really demonstrates for us our sinful condition and the need for a savior. 
For truly there would only be one who would be capable of taking our place and dying for us. The reality of the coming Messiah would be a person who had no sin because the sacrifice needed to be a perfect and holy one. If you go all the way back to the Old Testament, you see in the Old Testament when an animal was, was to be uh, slaughtered and sacrificed, that animal had to be without blemish. And so there was a process in investigating that. You see, for us, we could never die for our own sins because we're a sinner. And it brings an unholy sacrifice to a holy God. And so there needed to be a savior without a sin nature. Jesus comes to this earth. He's not with a sin nature because he's born of the Holy Spirit. For by one man, sin came into the world. That was Adam, and it passed down to all men. But Jesus was not born of Adam. He was holy and different. And so he alone could be the sacrifice that would be made for us. As you stop and you think about the words, it is finished, it's important to understand what exactly is this meaning? The word teleos in the Greek is commonly used in the New Testament. In fact, it's translated different places, different ways, but you kind of get the message of it all. Uh, one place it's translated, uh, it is made an end of. It is made an end of. It's finished. It is paid is also used. It has been performed, other places it's translated. It has been accomplished as well is a translation. And so we look at what exactly has been finished, what's been accomplished, what has Jesus done, what is, what is the outcome of Jesus' death on the cross. And so as Jesus is hanging there, he says those words, it is finished. And for us to understand these words, I think it's important to note that these words are, I believe, a word of victory. Because here in this first part, we see that this is the end of Jesus' sufferings. We could go on and on, and we could talk further about the sufferings of Christ. We talked about it on, on Friday evening to a large extent. We talked about the reality of his suffering. But Jesus has had a lifetime of suffering. And I think it's worth noting that the magnitude of Jesus' suffering begin even before the cross. There's a verse that you might want to write this address down. It's Psalm 88:15. And the psalmist is writing and he is prophesying about the Messiah, about Jesus. And it's in the first person where it says, I am afflicted and ready to die. Catch the next part from my youth up. Jesus and his suffering began with much anticipation. Jesus was anticipating something that was going to be horrific. It was going to be painful beyond description. It was going to be horrific in the sense that God the Father would turn his back for hours upon Jesus because Jesus now is taking upon himself my sin and yours. I don't know about you, but anticipation is a heavy weight, isn't it? Maybe you anticipate going to the doctors. Maybe you're going to have your annual physical. That's always a great time, isn't it? Maybe you've got something that you're anticipating. Maybe it's time for that root canal to take place. You say, yes, 10 o'clock, Tuesday morning. And not really. You see, there would be dread and there would be a, a real burden as you would think about it. Can you imagine what it was like for Jesus all throughout his earthly ministry anticipating the cross. It comes up time after time after time. In fact, you recall in John chapter 2, Jesus' first miracle where he turns the water into wine. You remember that miracle? Uh, you're at a wedding. You're, you're excited. It's a time of celebration. It's fantastic. But what does Jesus say? He makes a solemn reference when he says, during that time at the wedding of Cana, my hour has not yet come. Nicodemus visits Jesus, and we know that wonderful passage in John. He's interviewing him, and the Savior refers to being lifted up as a son of man. 
speaking there about his death on the cross, which after he was nailed to the cross, it was lifted up, and he would hang there, and he would die there. When James and John come to Jesus and they request two prominent positions in the kingdom of heaven, he makes mention of the cup which he had to drink and the baptism wherewith he must be baptized. When Peter confessed that Jesus was the Christ, what a wonderful moment. But the son of the living God, yes, he truly is. And after Peter makes that confession, he turns to his disciples and he begins to show them how that many things he would have to suffer at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes there in Jerusalem. He would indeed have to be killed, but yes, he would rise again on the third day. There was a great time when he was with his disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, and as he's talking to the disciples, he tells them some wonderful things about how he's going to build his church. But then he warns them and he says, but you're all going to fall away. You remember that passage? Peter says, oh, absolutely, I'm not going to fall away. Everybody else might desert you, but not me, Lord. And Jesus, right after that, in Matthew chapter 17, takes them up to the Mount of Transfiguration. In all likelihood, he is there. Elijah, Moses, and as they're discussing, they're discussing the coming sacrifice that Jesus would make on the cross. Very sobering. And it's as if the disciples in Matthew chapter 16 weren't interested in hearing any of that. It's, it's kind of like when you hold your ears and you start going, nya, 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 so you can't hear the person talking to you. It changes nothing. It changes no reality. The words spoken are still the words spoken. And so they didn't want to hear about the suffering of Jesus. They wanted to be prominent in the kingdom of God. And instead, what they find is that here they are with Elijah and Moses in this phenomenal event. But what does God say? God comes out of the heavens and God says, this is my son, Jesus. Listen to him. It's almost like on the way down the mountain, Jesus would indeed be listened to as he spoke more so of his suffering that would come to pass. You see, it was a very real, prominent thought that Jesus had. And the anticipation that Jesus has throughout this time period from his youth on up has been a weight upon him. These are words of victory because Jesus finally says it's finished. There's no more suffering. Uh, there's no more anticipation. What's done has been done, and he has died for the sins of the whole world. Hallelujah. Just moments after he makes that statement, it is finished, he gives up the Spirit. What a joy it must have been in his heart and mind to know that this suffering was complete. It has been accomplished. Well, not only is it an end to the suffering, but as we'll see, it's also an accomplishment of redemption. Jesus' death on the cross has accomplished much. He has paid for our sins. And as the songs this morning and the theology behind uh, the songs that we sang this morning so evidently painted the picture, it is Jesus who went to the cross for the sinner. And he hung there and he died because all of us are sinners and he dies there for the sins of the whole world. One theologian outlined four proofs that this work was accomplished, that redemption was accomplished. And the first thing he cites is the veil in the Holy of Holies in the temple. It was rent in two, the Bible says, torn from the very top to the very bottom. And that was a place of separation. That veil separated sinners in the, in the court to, uh, with a holy God. You see, our holy God could not have interaction with sinful men. And so the sacrifices that were made would be a temporary covering. By virtue of the veil being ripped in half, now you have sinners who can relate directly with a holy God. Isn't that worthy of our, our praise and worthy of our excitement? Amen. You see, you and I can now have a personal relationship with our holy God because we are clothed, not in our own good works, good deeds, our sin nature, but we're clothed with the blood of Jesus Christ which has washed away our sin and now allows us to come into a right relationship with God the Father. Now, that's pretty wonderful, isn't it? Another point that this theologian lists, he says, the raising of Jesus from the dead signaled that the sacrifice to God was accepted. 
You know, if Jesus had died as another sinful human being, he would be in the grave just like every other sinful human being. But Jesus was different. Jesus was God and is God. Jesus was 100% divine and 100% human. And as such, when he died, he came forth from the grave and it demonstrated that God had accepted that sacrifice, pointing to our redemption. Third of all, we see the exaltation of Jesus. And as Mark goes from the crucifixion to the resurrection right to the ascension, we see that truly uh, Jesus was exalted to his rightful place there on the right hand of God the Father. And he is there now. Our God has accomplished what he set out to accomplish. And God was pleased. And God brought him back up into heaven and set him there on the right hand. And no, I don't understand the Trinity and how all of that works out, but I am excited that the sacrifice was made and redemption was procured. Last but not least, the sending of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts demonstrates that redemption was accomplished. For we are sealed unto the day of redemption by God's Holy Spirit, each and every person who comes and places their faith in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this question. So again, what was finished? What was finished? When Jesus said, it is finished, what was accomplished? One word, everything. Everything. There is nothing that you and I can do as sinful human beings to add to the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ accomplished everything. There was a need for one who was perfect and holy to be a sacrifice and die in our place, and that is exactly what has transpired. There is no need for us as human beings to try to work ourselves into heaven. The Bible says that our righteousness is like a filthy rag in the sight of Almighty God. There is none who is able to do good, no, not one. All of our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. We can't even trust our own heart. You see, we are wicked and we offer nothing, but the good news is Jesus Christ offers everything. When Jesus said it's finished, he meant 100% of what we need was accomplished on the cross. My friends, that's the good news of the gospel. That means that you and I can come to faith in Jesus and have our sins forgiven. That is a wonder of wonders and an enormous, enormous blessing. Last but not least here with these words of victory, truly it is finished, led to the empty tomb. Because there never was a plan that involved anything but a resurrection. And we see that within this, God and the empty tomb proves that God is faithful. We see the faithfulness of God over and over again as we look at these scriptures. God is is faithful. He's been working a plan Since Adam and Eve fell into sin all the way back there in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, there is a mention of one who would come. And yes, he would be bruised, but he would be victorious over Satan. And here we have the empty tomb. Our God is faithful. He has had a plan since the very beginning. You go through centuries and centuries of the past, and you see how the Old Testament unfolds. You see all the prophecies about Jesus, all of them coming true, even the most minute, even the most detailed ones coming true, one after another. And you look at that, and you see the faithfulness of God. Our God is a faithful God. He has done exactly what he said he's going to do. Now, that bodes well for the future. I just want to say that. That bodes well for the future. Because the things that God has said are yet to come are yet to come. Don't you believe that? Now, that is exciting to to note that this empty tomb really shows the faithfulness of God. Now, I want to go back there to Matthew, if you would. You'd like to turn in your Bibles there to Matthew chapter 28, where Brian was reading. And I just want to underscore something that is of importance to us. The Bible says after the Sabbath, and I'm I'm reading from the the Holman Christian Bible, uh, but it says after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. And suddenly there was a violent earthquake uh, because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. 
He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. What a sight that must have been, right? His appearance was like lightning, and his robe was white as snow. The guards were so shaken from fear of him that they became like dead men. And the angel told the women, don't be afraid because I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been resurrected, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay or where he used to be. Come in here and you can, and you can do that. Now, sometimes we tend to skip over important verses of Scripture. And uh, if you turn back to Matthew chapter 26, I, I want to show you a verse of Scripture that is, is pretty important. In Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 26, you have the Lord's Supper. This is, he's up in the upper room, he's there with the disciples, and uh, they're breaking bread, and he's saying, take, eat, this is my body, and so forth. And after they get completely done with the Lord's Supper, it says, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you'll all fall away because of me this night, for it's written, I'll strike down the shepherd, the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. You read that passage of scripture, and what you usually read over is verse 32. Right? Would you agree? Verse 32 just says, but after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Oh, okay. Flip forward again to Matthew chapter 28. The angel is talking to the women. He says, if you'd like to come into this tomb, you can see where Jesus used to be. But then he says, go quickly and tell his disciples he's been raised from the dead. Next verse, or next uh, sentence. In fact, he is going ahead of you to Galilee and you will see him there. Then notice what the angel says. Listen up. This is what I'm telling you. You're going to see Jesus. Now, when you get to the book of Mark, you find out he's, he's been seen by the disciples some three times. But how about everybody else? How about these women who are at the feet of the cross? What about them? You, you see, the whole resurrection thing was not hidden. Jesus wanted people to know that he had indeed resurrected from the dead. And that's the exciting part here. In fact, if you follow on down further to verse 16, you'll see right there uh, where he is saying this. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. This is an appointment that you don't want to miss the significance of. This is an appointment you want to make sure you're there for. Are you with me? Because this is pretty significant. Before Jesus dies, he says, after I die, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. And then we find out that the angel says to the women, listen, don't forget. What about Galilee? You're going to see Jesus in Galilee. And then you have the 11 disciples, 12 minus Judas, and they're going to this appointment with Jesus to see the risen Jesus in Galilee on a mountain that Jesus had said, this is where I want you to meet me. How exciting it truly is. Maybe they went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Maybe it's there in Mount uh, Tabor. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say exactly which mountain it was, but I want you to know this. They all knew which mountain it was, and they were excited about it, and Jesus was excited about showing himself to them. How exciting it would be to be able to see Jesus, and this time you're going to see Jesus in a different way. Because you saw Jesus before, you saw him when he was scourged, when the wounds were open and gaping and the blood was flowing down and the thorns upon his head created all kinds of, of bleeding in him. You're going to see him, and yes, there are nail prints in his hands, but he's in a glorified body. There's no more pain, there's no more suffering. My friends, this is exciting to know that our God is able to accomplish these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul is writing, and he says this in verse three. For I've delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. See, it was all prophesied before. And he was buried, and then he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. 
And after that, he appeared to more than 500. There it is, verse 6. He appeared to more than 500. We don't even know how many people he appeared to. But the key is there. He appeared to them all at one time. Uh, not so that the statements would be, oh, yeah, I think I saw him. Remember when they used to look for Elvis everywhere? Oh, I think I spotted him. You know, uh, you got all these strange sightings. They are all together in one place, and it is unmistakable that this is the risen Jesus. Whoo! There's Joseph of Arimathea. Look, there's Nicodemus. Look, there's the, I remember he did this for, he raised, wow. You remember the inner three up on the Mount of Transfiguration, then we have the 12 disciples, and then we have the 70 that Jesus sent out, and then beyond that we have other followers of Jesus. All these people got together. I'm telling you, wouldn't you have loved to have been there? Woo, that must have been so exciting to be able to say, there's my risen Jesus. Everything that he said came true. Our God is faithful, is he not? He comes out with this, and don't miss the significance of this appointment. It's very easy to read over it. One theologian said, if a Christian understands all the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, but fails to understand this closing passage, he has missed the point of the entire book. This passage is the climax, and it's the major focal point, not only for this Gospel, but for the New Testament. You see, what ends up happening there in verse 16 of Matthew 28, after they traveled to Galilee, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted, some couldn't even believe, is that really him? Then Jesus came near to them and he said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, all the followers of Jesus would be given the great commission. And why were they all given the Great Commission? Because this is exactly why Jesus came and suffered and died and rose again. So that you and I might have the opportunity to place faith in him and be saved. And so the Great Commission goes out to these hundreds of people. How significant it was there as Jesus is hanging on the cross to say, it is finished. And we see this empty tomb proving that God is indeed faithful. Not only is God faithful, but God is powerful. God is so powerful. He's able to bring all of these things together, and we see the power of God. When I think of the ultimate display of power, I think of bringing someone back to life. The miracle of the resurrection. On Friday night, it's a somber time. We're here. We're reflecting on the suffering Savior. We know Sunday's coming, we reference that, and we look forward to this day. But I always have found that Saturday is always a weird day. I spend the day thinking about Jesus' body laying in the tomb. Isn't that weird? I do. And I think I just feel so much better when I wake up on Sunday morning, especially if there's no sunrise service. I wake up and I think to myself, Jesus' body isn't there in the tomb. 1 Corinthians 15 teaches us very clearly that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. When Jesus Christ came forth from that tomb, he's the first fruits of everyone who's a follower of his. And someday, and we can think of our loved ones who are, whose bodies are laying in the tomb, they will not always lay in the tomb. They will come forth just as Jesus did. If I die before the coming of the Lord, you can understand this one thing, that my body will lay there, but one day it's going to come forth from that tomb. How exciting it is to know that the power of the resurrection demonstrates the awesome power of God. And what is it for God who can do all things to resurrect those who are in Christ Jesus? What a blessing it is to stop and think about those who will be resurrected and given eternal life. Now, it's a sobering thought, but God is all-powerful. He will resurrect not only those uh, who are the faithful, uh, but he will also resurrect those who are not. And there is a different judgment for those. So you want to make certain that you are a person of faith, knowing that Jesus Christ is truly your Savior. Not only is God faithful, not only is he all-powerful, but he's also all-loving. Some might ask, why would Jesus do what he has done? John 15 says, Greater love is no man than this, than one laid down his life for his friends. And over in the book of Romans, 
uh, great passage of scripture in Romans chapter uh, five. Uh, when we look at verse eight, it says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we'll be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God did what he did because he loves us. And my friends, you and I have an enormous need and God has met that need in the person of Jesus Christ. A video that captures the needs that we have as human beings and just kind of illustrates what God has done. Uh, I wanna show that for you just to, just to think about what he has done. You, look at your eyes, look at them, speckled colorful, each one unique, and I created every one of them. I created everything, the universe, and you. I gave you your personality. I made you pure, complex, and every day, I give you life. I love you, but something happened. You cheated on me. You didn't trust me. You sinned. You cut yourself off from me. And although you're still alive, you were slowly dying. So you looked for other things. To fill the void. But nothing works. It just kills you faster. And it separates us more and more. What are you searching for? destroyed, but to know me, so I became one of you, a fragile creation. I was tempted, but I never sinned. I came to save you. You have so many sins, and they have a cost. Someone has to die. You me. So I took on your sin and traded in my life for yours. And I died in your place. Because I love you. Then follow me would you bow your heads please
I'd like to ask you this morning if you would spend a moment to look into your own heart and life today and examine your relationship to God. Jesus Christ has died for you. We've talked a lot about it. But maybe you're here this morning and God's at work in your heart because you've never placed your faith totally in him. Maybe you're here this morning and there are questions, there are things that trouble you. Maybe there's a gap in your life that you just can't explain. Maybe you're not satisfied. There's just a lack of peace. However you term it, you would know if God is working in your heart this morning. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. I'm happy to say that he saved me. He came and he died in my place. And as a boy, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And he was faithful to take away my sin and give me new life. And I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today because of what he has done. That's true not only for me, but for millions who have placed their faith in Christ. If you're here this morning and God's tugging at your heart, that is a really good thing. That is a really wonderful thing. You say, I can't explain how I feel at this moment. That's God at work in your life. If God is moving you to make a decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I would encourage you in the strongest possible way not to ignore God's work in your heart today. Perhaps you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, I'm looking at my own heart. I know God's at work in my life. I would love the opportunity just to pray for you this morning. I'm not going to pray for you by name or embarrass you in any way, but just I'd like to pray for you today if God's at work in your heart. We have folks at the front who will be here after the service is all over. If you want to come and talk to them, ask them questions, um, have a word of prayer with them, whatever you'd like, they're here for you. But as I close in prayer now before our closing song, I wonder if you'd be here and say, Pastor Kevin, remember me in prayer. God's at work in my life. Is there anyone, just slip up your hand, that I could pray for you today? God's at working, God's working in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Just raising your hand doesn't mean that you've made a decision. And it doesn't mean the opportunity for making a decision to trust Christ is over. But take advantage of the opportunity that you have today if God is working in your heart to call upon the name of the Lord, placing your faith in Jesus Christ and be saved. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for the opportunity that we've had, just an awesome opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for working in hearts today. May you continue to do a mighty work in our hearts and lives this morning. And may we come to that place where we yield ourselves to you and place our faith totally in Jesus, acknowledging him as our true savior. Work in lives, Lord. I thank you for these who've raised their hands. May you finish the work that you've started, I pray, and ask this in Jesus' wonderful name, amen.